Welcome back. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Nashville Predators today. Uh, rounding out the Western teams that lost in the first round. Tomorrow I will be, talk be talking about the New York Islanders. Uh, the last team in the East that lost in the first round that I have not talked about yet in these videos. Uh, Nashville, just looking at the last three years, it shows that uh, things could go either way for this team. So 2021-2022, they had a 45-30-7 and record. 97 points. Then they got swept in the first round by Colorado that year. So that was the year, of course, that they were they were vastly overmatched. Uh, they did their best, but they just they they couldn't get over the hump. Uh, Connor Ingram had quite the coming out party in that series, uh, but either way, going into the 2022-2023 season, we weren't sure what to expect from them. They finished 42, 32, and eight, 92 points. They missed the playoffs. They were in amongst that turtle derby where it didn't feel like anybody wanted to be in the playoffs, and. Uh, we ended up with Winnipeg making the playoffs, and then they were out in the first round in five that year. This year, 2023-2024, nothing was expected of Nashville. They were expected to maybe go into a rebuild, right? However, 47-30-5 and five was the record, 99 points, so better in terms of points than they were two years ago. In the first round against Vancouver, they lost in six. It was <clears throat> not the prettiest of hockey in that first round series, and Nashville just could not find the goals when they needed them. Now, Philip Forsberg had a career year, best year in his career, and set new records uh, in terms of goals. Set a new record for goals in a season by a Nashville player. Uh, plays all 82 games, 48 goals, 46 assists, 94 points. Really nice bounce back after an injury-riddled season last year. Yossi played all 82 games as well. He had a fantastic second half of the season. 23 goals, 62 assists, 85 points for him in those 82 games. And again, that second half of the season, Nashville played absolutely great. They were on, what, that 16, 18-game point streak. Nyquist had a career year as well. Gustav Nyquist, 81 games, 23 goals, 52 assists, 75 points. Just remarkable numbers for Nyquist. And when we get over to contracts, uh, you'll see how these guys have got really fantastic production from players who aren't necessarily being paid as much as guys who produce less on other teams. Uh, now, in terms of players, 22 years of age or younger, Evangelista, 80 games, 16 goals, 23 assists, 39 points. I think we've just started to scratch the, surf scratch the surface with him, as well as Philip Tomasino, who played 41 games, 7 goals, 13 assists, 20 points. So over a full schedule, you just double those numbers, and they end up pretty similar to Evangelista. <clears throat> UC Parsonen. Uh, 44 games, 8 goals, 4 assists, 12 points. Parsonen, a uh, really good, solid player. I don't know how much offensive upside's there, but he, he plays the game well enough that regardless of his offensive numbers, he's still in their lineup. Uh, UC Saros, 35, 24, and 5, 906 save percentage. Remember, at one point this year, there was discussion of whether or not they might trade him. And now the expectation is they're going to extend him. At least maybe. Uh, Lankinen, 17, 11, and 6 with a 908 save percentage. Should he go to market? Uh, Lankinen shouldn't have a problem finding another job. He was a very reliable backup for them. And at points this year, he was out playing Saros. Not by the end of the season, but at points he was. Uh, Askarov, who is seen as being the next one for Nashville. One and one record with a 943 save percentage. He had very good numbers on an AHL squad that, uh, that has had a pretty good season. And they're still playing in the AHL playoffs at the time I'm recording this. So again, the 12 goals in six games against the Canucks. Uh, really indicative of how this team doesn't really have like an explosive offense outside of Forsberg and Yossi. And so that's something that may keep them out of the realm of being a contender. But with the work ethic this team has, uh, they're always going to be competitive. And who knows, maybe they get themselves into a playoff spot next year as well. Now, there are a number of players on this team that are 32 years of age or older. Uh, Yossi, Nyquist, uh, O'Reilly is another one. McDonough, Barry. Uh, Zucker and Shen, all players 32 years of age or older who played for the team this year. So definitely some veteran presence. How many of those go get jettisoned in the offseason? I'll learn how to speak. It'll happen. Uh, Zucker, pending UFA, probably goes. He was just a rental at the deadline. Uh, Beauvillier, I think, probably goes as well. Uh, Sherwood, you got to keep Sherwood. I, I think anyways, they got to keep Sherwood. Uh, Tyson Berry, very, very likely to be gone. Carrier, I think they got to find a way to keep Carrier. Lankinen, probably let him go and give Askarov the spot as the backup. And Saros can be the starter. Uh, then you have pend pending restricted free agents. Jared Anderson Dolan, who was picked up from the Kings, is a restricted free agent. 
Tomasino, Parsonen. Uh, Tomasino, probably a two-year deal. Parsonen, probably the same. Uh, Stastny on the blue line was good in a call-up. Del Gaizo, uh, some, some potential there as well. But there isn't anybody in terms of the pending UFAs or RFAs who's going to really break the bank and make like truckloads of money for this team. And really what's interesting with Nashville is they don't have like a big monster contract on this team. There are a couple to get debated, but we'll get there. And uh, and I think this this team's got a, a pretty solid base to build around. So cap space for them on July the 1st, $19,295,801. This is a team that has not been anxious to spend right up to the cap. They haven't needed to use LTIR to stay below the cap which is unusual for teams above the playoff line. Uh, and so, yeah, there's some space there that they're going to be able to, to work with. Uh, now, in this year's draft, they have their own first-round pick. They have three second-round picks, two-thirds and three-fourths. Uh, next year, they have two first-round picks, a second-round pick, two-thirds, and then from rounds four through six, one each. And it's, it's worthy of note and something to keep an eye on because, of course, it does feel like there's some retooling going on while the team's still staying competitive on the ice. I do enjoy that. I think that is one of the best ways to go about it. You move out, you move out assets you know you're not going to keep. You get future assets back, draft picks and prospects, and you try to make sure that you're putting a roster out there that's competitive at the same time. Uh, so that, that balance between looking at the future and not wanting to sacrifice the present, I think Barry Trotz has done it well. Uh, I think David Poyle did it well himself too. Uh, but yeah, Barry Trotz going into his second year as GM, I think he showed in his first year, he's pretty good at it. Uh, and Andrew Burnett did a pretty good job as coach. He's a finalist for the Jack Adams Award. So Nashville was a surprise. It's always tough for a surprise uh, to follow up the next season with the same kind of record. Seattle comes to mind in that category. Uh, but they have some good players on the way. You have Matthew Wood, a forward. He can play all three positions. Uh, Tanner Melendic, who's a defenseman. Uh, Joachim Kemmel who was a right winger and at the time they drafted him I felt like this guy could be could be a steal for them and that could still be the case and then Zachary LaRue uh, who is a left winger there are some good young players on the way up for this team we'll see how many of them get in and again because Barry Trotz has said he wants younger faster players up front uh, that means there could be some openings for the kids or at the very least he could be out there shopping for more this summer so again, they're working to extend Saros this summer. That's going to be a key thing to keep an eye on because if he makes ridiculous demands, I don't think he will, but if he did, I think Barry Trotz would then have a, a decision to make. Is it better for the team long-term to just give Saros a big long-term extension or is it better to maybe explore the trade route? Uh, it would be a ridiculous amount I would think they'd look for for Saros. That was a rumor when he was reportedly on the block. All it meant was they were taking calls, and if you gave them an absolutely insane offer, they'd take it while they were laughing and hung up the phone. But I, I don't see Saros going anywhere. I just don't think it's going to happen. But a Skarov could force that at some point later. I don't think now's the time. Uh, so good contracts. I wanted to talk about good contracts on this team because there are a number. Uh, Forsberg at $8.5 million till 2030. At $8.5 million, you get 48 goals from him, 94 points. Um, considering where the cap's going, that Forsberg contract's just going to look better as time goes by. It's going to be a better and better contract with each passing season if he can stay healthy. And that's the key thing with Forsberg. This year he did. Hopefully next year he can as well. O'Reilly, $4.5 million cap hit for two more seasons. Absolute bargain for what O'Reilly gave them this season. Uh, Nyquist, $3.185 million contract. One more year at that cap hit. That's insane. 75 points and a $3.185 million cap hit, it's robbery. It really is. But, I mean, Nyquist did it to himself by having a career year. I don't think Nyquist does that again next year, but I didn't think he was going to do it this year. So we shall see. Um, and then Yossi, $9.059 million a year uh, until 2028. So he's got four years left in that. I remember when he signed that contract, there was a lot of, well, he's not going to be good for that entire contract. That contract's terrible. So far, that contract's been pretty good. And again, when players sign those long-term deals, when GMs and teams sign those long-term deals, I think everybody's aware that in years seven and eight, the player won't be as effective as they are in year one and two. But you're trying to keep that cap hit down a little bit. And I think for what Yossi's provided them, he is a finalist for the Norris. $9.059 million is the cap hit. Not too shabby. 
Uh, and then there's Saros. One more year left. Again, he can sign a contract extension as soon as July the 1st. $5 million cap hit. It's a bargain. It's a bargain for what Saros brings. And that bargain is going to be coming to an end next summer. And then the question becomes, again, are you better off signing him to that long-term extension? Or are you better off letting somebody else pay that big long-term extension? And maybe a Skarov would be ready and you'd have another goaltender there. But it'll be interesting to see what Barry Trotz does. Um, now, there's there's some cap issues this team has as well, though. What's interesting is they have all this cap space on July the 1st to bring players in. But their buyout cap hit for the Matt Duchesne buyout and Kyle Turris, they're still paying the Kyle Turris buyout, $7,556,556 is the cap penalty for them next year. And that goes up by a million dollars the following season. The good news being the salary cap, which is going up this summer, should go up again next summer. Uh, the retained cap hit, so these are trades they've made and decided to hold on to some money from those contracts. Johansson, $4 million, $4 million of that is Johansson, and the other $250,000 is uh, Ekholm. I don't know why I was trying to give Ekholm an extra $5,000. I guess I just think he's really good, which he is. Um, ask any Oilers fan or any Preds fan, and, and ask me. I, I've been saying that for years with Ekholm. But the, the retained salary on Johansson was necessary because they wanted to be rid of that cap hit. And it does buy them $4 million in cap space because it's an $8 million cap hit altogether for Johansson. And they retained 50% of that. But just think, if it wasn't for that $12 million, they would have so much cap space on July the 1st. But what offsets the amount of cap penalties and retained cap is the fact that they've got a lot of guys on bargain contracts. So are they going to be able to pick up a player on another bargain contract? They might. Uh, Barry Trotz is, is definitely um, proving that he's he's learned quickly on the job. I think he has David Poyle probably on quick dial. Uh, anytime stuff's going down, and, and definitely it feels like uh, things in Nashville are in pretty good hands. So let me know your thoughts if you're a Nashville fan. Do you feel like this team's going to be able to build itself back up to become a contender? Do you feel like this team's better off doing a retool or are you happy with where they're at? That they're right middle of the pack and, and maybe a playoff team, maybe not, but competitive every night. And uh, again, if you make the playoffs, who knows what might happen. If they had been able to solve those Canucks goaltenders just a little more regularly, they would be out there playing against Edmonton instead of Vancouver. But let me know your thoughts. Hit like and subscribe if you've not done so already. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.